Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bill Tizinski, and I am the program chair for the Joseph Priestley Society of the Science History Institute. And I'm pleased to welcome you to our first program of the 2021-22 season. Our fall programs will focus on food technology. So today's program is the new farm, indoor agricultural technology. In October, we'll be looking at plant-based cheeses for pizza, one of my favorite subjects. And uh, in November, we'll be looking at advanced polymer films for food preservation. So keep up with that and continue to attend. Uh, last year, we had a very successful partnership with the American Chemical Society to present all of our meetings in a virtual format. And we've decided to continue with that. We will do two hybrid meetings in October and February. We'll have in-person attendees, COVID working, COVID permitting. And uh, we look forward to hopefully seeing you there in person. We have over 130 registrants today. And I hope that many, if not all of you, have clicked the uh, optional donation button on the uh, registration form because that helps support some of the work done by the Institute and uh, is an important component of what they do. So today's program, as I mentioned, is covering the new, front, new, for, new farm, indoor agricultural technology. And today will be a moderated conversation of leaders in that field, although I'm not sure you can say field when they're growing indoors. Um, for those in attendance, we will have a question and answer period at the end of the program. And so please enter your questions into the chat function and we'll be monitoring that and then take as many questions as we can. The program is being recorded and will be posted on this Institute's YouTube channel as well. <clears throat> so it's my pleasure now to introduce our moderator, Dr. Annabelle morales -Droz. She is the President and Chief Science Officer of Fusion Farms in Puerto Rico. Uh, she has a PhD in microbiology and has past experience working with NASA, the USDA, a name familiar to Philadelphia people, Roman Haas, and the Atchison Group before recently joining Fusion Farms. She has long experience in food safety and food science and has assembled a distinguished panelist of international collaborators. That's one of the benefits of hybrid meetings is we can have panelists, speakers from all around the world. So with that, I will be quiet and turn things over to Annabelle. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Bill, for that introduction. Um, I'm excited beyond belief about today's program. And um, as Bill mentioned, we're going to be talking about the new farm and it's specifically indoor agricultural technology. So how do we fix our broken food system? How do we improve the way in which we grow produce, fresh produce? How do we improve the way in which we distribute that product not only locally but globally. We have over 10 billion people, an estimate um, in terms of how many people in, on the planet we expect to have by 2050. About 70 percent of agricultural land it's already uh, that's available, it's already being farmed. So how do we find options? How do we look at solutions of not only growing horizontally but growing vertically? And when you look at indoor vertical farm, it is a great solution for providing optimal conditions to grow produce indoors. And some of those benefits in, in, include the ability to produce all kinds of crops and deliver those crops all year round. In terms of the water that is used, about 90% less water is needed about 90% less land. Uh, in terms of productivity, you have hundreds of times more productivity using this indoor vertical farming solution. 
um, with zero pesticides, all that compared to the traditional field farming. So when you look at control environment agriculture, it clearly has lots of the efficiencies. It optimizes the use of resources and those resources include water, energy, it includes uh, space, capital and labor. Today we have a amazing group of panelists who are going to be um, sharing with you how they grow their foods, what sort of methods they're, they're using, and what are some of the new innovations that they're going to be looking forward to in the future. Um, we can grow just about any commercially viable crop anywhere in the world using this technology. So I'm gonna briefly introduce you or have the panelists introduce themselves. Um, so Jessica, please tell us who you are, what you do and what you grow. Sure, thanks Annabelle. Um, so I'm Jessica, I'm the founder and CEO of Common Farms. We're based out here in Hong Kong. And my background was in restaurant and manufacturing business. And I actually had no experience in um, growing agriculture, but I was facing a problem. Um, I was a consumer of imported produce from the restaurant side. And I started, I started seeing the fluctuation of prices, the quality and the availability. And um, I really didn't want to get into food production because having the experience of manufacturing, I knew how hard that was going to be. But it was just through research and trial and error, that was kind of the only solution that I thought would fit um, to really solve the problem. And so um, the way I looked at it was starting it off with the market. We import 98% of food um, to Hong Kong. So there was a massive market that we could tackle. Um, we don't have a lot of space in Hong Kong. Space is very scarce and expensive. Um, so we also had another problem to tackle there. Um, and that's why we ended up with um, indoor. And for the Hong Kong context, we do indoor vertical. Um, and in terms of what we grow is we grow specialty crops um, because the alternative would be all flown in and with really high wastage um, high transport cost, um, high wastage food cost. Um, and these specialty produce include the microgreens, the edible flowers, the baby leaves, um, and also what we call garnish leaves. And things that we're currently dabbling with is um, mushrooms and calerpa, which is um, sea grapes. All of these are relatively high um, consumption and they're all flown in from different parts of the world for us in Hong Kong. And the system that we use is because I didn't have a lot of um, agriculture experiences. So I kind of just, whatever system was gonna help me grow the amount of diversity and the quality that we need. So we do a hybrid system. Um, there's a part hydroponic and we also do some um, with uh, soil base. Fantastic. Um, I, so we're going to get into the specifics and the methods of growth and the technology that you're using. So okay. thank you so very much for sharing. Um, Omar, tell us about you, who you are, what you grow, and what and how you do it. Sure. So my name is Omar Aljindi. I founded Badia Farms in Dubai back in 2016. Uh, we uh, grow, um, you know, we use a vertical farm indoor, we use hydroponics. And I look forward to telling you more about our farm crops and, you know, our, share some experiences. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, Stacy. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Annabelle. So my name is Stacy Kimmel, and I'm the Vice President of Research and Development at Aero Farms. We are based in Newark, New Jersey. And we grow primarily leafy greens and microgreens, but I'll talk a little bit about later some of the really interesting uh, technology development and other types of, of items that we're working on growing uh, right now in our research uh, program. We do grow aeroponically and vertically. A little bit about myself, I'm a food scientist and I've been in the food industry for 23 years leading new product technology innovation, uh, for Fortune 500 CPG companies. And at Aero Farms, I lead a team of plant scientists, molecular biologists, growers, and data scientists. And I'll tell you all about what we do there and how they work with uh, the team at Aero Farms. Uh, in the Fantastic. Thank you so very much. Um, Kendall. 
Thanks, Annabelle. Uh, my name is Kendall Lang, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Fusion Farms. We are located in Mayaguez, Puerto Rico. Uh, we are a hurricane-protected indoor vertical aquaponics farm. So we focus on deep water culture, and we have both tilapia and leafy greens in a controlled closed loop uh, environment. We grow 99 different varieties of leafy greens. We do microgreens. We do uh, flowering uh, vegetables as well. So strawberries, cucumbers, tomatoes, um, and excited to be part of this panel. So thank you. Thank you so very much. So get, let's get into it. We're going to start with a bit of a deep dive in terms of the methods of growth. As you can see, each one of the panelists is located in a completely different geographical location and using very different technologies. So I'm gonna start with Jessica. Tell us a bit more about the methods or methods of growth that you're using to grow your leafy greens and any technology that you are using that it's helping you track and control the environment within your farm. Sure, so um, we do we do, do um, a hybrid system. So part hydroponic and part um, soil base because of the diversity that we need. Um, in terms of the, the hardware technology, we don't focus too much on that because actually in the market, there's quite a few options. Um, what's actually really important for us is a system that doesn't break too easily. Um, it also has some level of longevity and it's low maintenance um, and it allows us to grow the diversity. Um, the technology that we really focus on is how do we um, how do we get to distribute the produce that we grow? Because there's no point of growing any of our produce if we can't get those produce to our customers. So the calibration between our supply and the demand is where we really focus on in terms of um, the technology. Um, and then in the growing side is just making sure it's a consistent growing system. Um, of course, we have the whole um, sensor system to make sure we can grow that consistently. Great, thank you so very much. Omar. Yeah, so, uh, so we use hydroponics and uh, with, uh, we're using all, all types of uh, hydroponic growing. So we're, we grow an ebb and flow where we're, you know, we fill the tray then flush it. We're growing in NFT channels. Uh, we're actually growing as well, uh, as Kanda was mentioning, we're using a deep water culture as well, but without, uh, without the fish. Um, in terms of technology, we focused a lot on the LEDs, uh, try to um, understand the impact of each uh, uh, light spectrum on the plants. And our focus has been from day one to grow a premium crop that we can uh, produce you know, to the, the five-star hotels, the top chefs. So it's been taste, taste, taste for us from day one. Um, you know, it's interesting to see what's happening in the industry. When we started, we were using you know, uh, a small amount of sensors in the farm, while right now we've, we've there's tons of amount of sensors with, you know, um, uh, connecting it to AI, it's managing our climate, energy, water, uh, you know, you can call it automated growing or data driven, data driven growing. So it's really interesting to see that development in a short period of time. And it's just exciting to see what else will come um, in the next few years. Yes, indeed, millions of data points being collected to optimize uh, the conditions in which the plants are grown. Um, thank you very, very much. Um, Stacy. Um, same question to you in terms of methods, technology, and um, in, from your perspective and from your lens, the research and development, um, we can talk about the, you know, the biology, the selection of the seeds, and so on. Sure, so I think generally, as I mentioned, we, we grow, um, using aeroponics. So seeds are placed on a proprietary grow medium and the roots will penetrate the cloth of the grow medium and the roots are misted with target nutrients, water and oxygen. But there's a lot of things that are going on beyond the actual aeroponic growing. So we like to think of it as an integrated mechanical uh, program to optimize the performance of the farm. So one of the things that we spend a lot of time on, uh, and uh, Omar mentioned it, is LED lighting. So we manage our own supply chain for LED lights and we control the design of our LED lights because that is critical to um, how we grow and some of the things that we're able to do as we grow. So, um, you know, manipulate uh, the growing conditions to manage nutrition or flavor 
or other types of high value materials that might we might be able to be uh, might be interested in. So it, all the while, though, uh, we have a massive uh, sensor system in our farm, uh, and we're collecting data from hundreds of sensors uh, real time and using that as part of a feedback loop to continuously optimize. And we've recently uh, entered into a partnership with Nokia Bell Labs uh, to continue to uh, use this high tech um, data capture technology to help us advance the way we farm, how we're monitoring our farm every day, and how we're um, optimizing conditions. And we'll be using machine vision, advanced machine vision technology and drone technology to uh, help us uh, continue to advance this program. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much. Um, Kendall. Uh, thanks, Annabelle. So we are a uh, vertical aquaponics farm. So we are uh, water farmers. We have no soil in our system. We're growing in a controlled environment, uh, controlled aquaponics environment. And so what that means is that we have fish and plants in the same environment that are living off of the same water. So the fish are really the nutrient engine in the nitrogen cycle for us. Um, and that provides the high nutrient value, uh, broad spectrum nutrients for the plants. Um, and so once we have uh, the system balanced and aquaponics is uh, typically a little more challenging in terms of getting to a balanced environment because you're dealing with three different biomes. Uh, you have the plant biome, the water biome, and then the microbiome of, of a variety of different impacts. So getting to a balanced system is the key in our environment. Uh, we are because of the uh, closed loop water system, we're able to grow any number of variety of plants. We don't ever flush our system. It's constantly circulating. So the plants pull out the ammonia and the nitrates and nitrites and clean the water for the fish. Uh, the fish then become the primary uh, nutrient source for this closed loop system. Um, and as, a, uh, as others have alluded, we are also in a uh, very heavy LED environment which generates heat. Uh, so we are then dealing with controlling the temperature and humidity. So we have a very specific uh, heat target of about 72 degrees in our environments. We're looking for about 45 to 50% humidity. Uh, we're also controlling the CO2 levels. Uh, we're constantly monitoring uh, vapor pressure deficits, uh, looking at a whole variety of sensors as well. So we're monitoring not only the air conditions, but also the water conditions. So on a daily basis, we're monitoring pH levels, nutrient levels, uh, looking at dissolved oxygen, which is a huge component of uh, criteria for optimal growth uh, for our systems. So we are producing 90% um, of our revenue comes out of the leafy greens side of the business, but we are also selling uh, tilapia as part of the protein source uh, in the local marketplace that we're doing on a whole fish basis. So we're not processing fish, we're just selling them whole live fish. Thank you so very much. That should give um, our audience a, you know, a great perspective of various different ways of growing uh, in terms of the methods, the technology, and the type of crops that each one of you is uh, growing. I'm gonna shift my attention to the economics, the viability of indoor vertical farming. So when we look at recent races by some of the key players in our space in vertical farming, um, you know, we can see that indoor farming not only promises, you know, growth for crops, but also for companies and for their uh, backer investments. Um, I'm going to quote, um, according to Market to Markets, um, the global market indoor farming is expected to grow at a compound annual growth rate of 9.4% by 2026 to reach about $24.8 billion. So I'd like for each one of you to speak to that. You know, how do you, you know, um, optimize the use of your resources in terms of water, energy, space, capital, and labor to balance those inputs and outputs? Um, so I'm gonna start with you, Jessica. Um, so the way we look at, well, let's start with the, the context that we're in. Operating a farm in Hong Kong is very expensive. We don't really have the infrastructure, the space available. 
for that. So we actually have to make all the unit economics make sense, the inputs um, more efficient and optimal. Um, the way we've been looking at it, because we can't have access of mass acres of, of land to develop, we actually utilize idle spaces um, to, to, for our growing. Um, but what it allows us to do is our CapEx gets to be relatively lower because we can utilize the infrastructure that's already there. So the water source, um, the electricity source. Um, of course, it's not 100%. The most expensive would be labor and electricity. Um, but then on the counter side, you have water costs that's extremely low. Um, on the labor side, what we are not fully automatic, um, automated, but as we're taking increments, it allows our, our labor force to be more and more efficient and we don't have to hire as many people. Um, yeah, the way we think about it is we, we build uh, micro farms and we wanna build a network of them. And that way it allows us to grow um, incrementally, but grow, um, relatively quickly as well. Thank you. Um, Omar. Um, so in our case, uh, I believe Badia Farms is, is one of the few self-funded uh, you know, vertical farms in the world. So uh, from day one, our goal was really to try to uh, find out is this is vertical farming for real or, or is it just a hype? So you know, through the process, I, you know, I studied and researched what were the challenges, why are, there, why are farms being successful or not being successful? So, um, you know, one of the, the, the findings was, you know, uh, CapEx and OpEx uh, are usually high. So uh, we decided that we would design our own systems. We manufactured it in uh, Saudi Arabia and then had, uh, sent it to Dubai. Um, as well, we wanted to see how much automation is required. Again, and the idea was to make sure our the end goal is to make sure this is a commercially viable business and we do end up making money uh, versus trying to, uh, you know, just go one step at a time and, and, tr and, and hope that in 10 years it would become uh, viable in terms of OPEX. Um, uh, I'm happy to report that water is one of our least costs. So, uh, you know, August, which is the peak of the summer here, our uh, our bill for waters was around $250, which is lower than uh, uh, my bill at home. Uh, so that was phenomenal. Uh, power is actually huge. So in Dubai specifically, power is expensive. We pay around uh, 12 to 14 cents per kilowatt. Uh, which is which, which is quite hefty, and then rent as well uh, is pretty high in, in in Dubai. So we pay around uh, ten dollars per uh, square feet. So these are the two items that uh, you know take a big chunk of our opex. But other than that, we're we're just using the exact uh, automation required. Uh, labor cost is is not expensive, where so we're we're utilizing that as well. Thank you so much. Um, Stacy. Thank you. So, I mean, relative to economics, I think a lot of the same things that you're hearing from the other panelists we're doing as well. I think it, it looks like a systems approach. We're looking at our energy inputs and how to improve our farm designs are evolving continuously. We also design our own farm uh, equipment. So as I mentioned, LED lighting is a big source of uh, energy usage in farms. So we're continuously um, trying to improve our efficiency of lighting. Um, our yields are constantly increasing and we're doing things uh, every day to try and improve our yields and reduce our growing cycle so that we become more and more competitive with field farm. The one thing that we are doing, which is, which is really interesting from an R&D perspective is that we're looking a lot at genetics of the plants. So we have recently engaged uh, with a consortium called the Precision Indoor Plants Consortium. And this consortium is a group of companies, non-competitive companies, we're all looking essentially at how do we uh, think about growing and seeds for specifically for controlled environment agriculture. And part of that, uh, at least initially, is to look at lettuce and post-harvest browning and how the biological environmental conditions of growing indoors impact post-harvest browning. 
And in, in doing that, we're looking at genetic markers and other traits that can lead not only to improve post-harvest browning, but also increasing yield and quality um, and how you might use other types of uh, indoor growing techniques to accelerate breeding for lettuce. That's great. We're going to come back to that point about partnerships because that's a really key important point and I'd like the audience to learn more about some of the key partnerships that all of you have engaged in to move forward in terms of you know technologies and or solutions. Um, so Kendall, thank you. It's easy. Yeah, so when we look at CapEx and OpEx, uh, one of the unique parameters in Puerto Rico is that the government of Puerto Rico through the Puerto Rico Industrial Development Company or PRIDCO has 1,700 uh, buildings around the island that were part of the pharmaceutical boom uh, and then have become vacant as those uh, companies exited when the tax incentives went away. So we are actually leasing property uh, for our building right now is uh, built in 1961. It's a concrete uh, building. It's essentially a bunker. It's why it's, you know, it survived since 1961, all the hurricanes and tropical storms. It survived Hurricane Maria. So we're focused on that inventory of real estate and reusing it to both create jobs and to create uh, a, a change in the import trade imbalance that we have where three and a half billion dollars worth of goods comes into the island that is 95% of the food that's consumed in Puerto Rico is imported. So part of our vision and mission is to reuse this government real estate, uh, which Omar, you'll appreciate, we can, we're leasing this at $2 per square foot per year. Um, so it's uh, very inexpensive from that standpoint, below replacement cost for sure. Um, so it's very attractive to be able to use that real estate. So from a CapEx standpoint, we don't have a real estate development cost, but we do have the infrastructure cost. So when we look at We've custom designed the steel racks for our vertical grow systems, and we've designed them. Uh, right now, we have 56 foot long grow troughs. Um, and part of that is, I'll talk about in just a second, which is our uh, carousel grow schedule. But the capex, we try and keep as low as possible. So inside these buildings, we're looking at you know, the, the lowest possible cost for all of our components of construction. And we're focusing on not automating the things that would replace jobs. So we're focused on job creation as part of our vision and mission. So we're not looking at you know, completely artificial intelligence or robotics. Uh, we do have automation of you know, certain components that are just super efficient, but part of our vision and mission is creating jobs for Puerto Ricans. Um, so we're not focusing on the complete automation. So the lower the CapEx costs, we do have a little bit higher costs um, in terms of uh, infrastructure. So Omar, you had mentioned uh, your kilowatt hour costs. Um, unfortunately, Puerto Rico has almost double that cost. We're paying between 28 cents and 32 cents per kilowatt hour, which is what's driving us to focus on solar and wind and anaerobic digestive biomethanation and some other really unique technologies, geothermal and some others. So we're working, we have a memorandum of understanding with the National Renewable Energy Labs or NREL out of Colorado who's helping us design and define an absolute um, alternative, clean, renewable energy plan to get those costs down. So we believe we can get down to the rates that you're talking about, and that actually increases our uh, net profits uh, in the process. But one of the key features when you look at OPEX, um, and what we focus on is the market feasibility and saying, how, what are we going to grow? How much are we able to sell it for? And who is our target customer? So we are a wholesale to distributors only model. We are not doing uh, retail per se. And so what we're focusing on is the niche for grocery stores that are focused on their customer base, which as a customer, you would recognize, you know, you don't go buy all of your tomatoes for one time a year. Unfortunately, that's how traditional farmers grow is one, two, maybe if they're really efficient farmers, they can get three crops per year. Well, we've uh, structured our carousel schedule so that we are actually delivering 52 harvests a year, weekly harvests to our grocery stores, which is more consistent with the way consumers buy. So we've been able to, we just signed a letter of intent two months ago with the largest grocery store chain in Puerto Rico. And it was primarily because of our 52 weekly harvests that we could deliver the quality and the quantity on island that allowed us to win that. And we're getting you know, very good competitive prices. We could actually charge less than imports if we wanted to, but right now because of the quality 
uh, and the niche uh, crops that we're focusing on, we actually get higher premium prices for that, uh, which helps us you know, generate higher total revenues and, and higher profit margins. So we're excited about you know, all the components where we differentiate um, and allow us to create that, you know, we're mirroring as much as possible mother nature uh, in terms of what you would see at a pond or a river or a lake in that ecosystem, but we're taking out the risks in terms of, you know, mother nature, pests and hurricane, you know, storm issues and things like that. Yeah, so all those resources that you talked about in terms of, you know, specifically energy, let's focus on that. And this question is addressed to all uh, panelists. I'll start with uh, Jessica. Um, what are some of the partnerships, whether those partnerships are with government, with private industry, or with individuals, have you put in place or are looking into establishing those collaborations or joint ventures in order to facilitate your growth? I'm going to start with Jessica. Sure. Um, so for us, Hong Kong, we don't, um, in terms of the government, we don't have a whole lot of um, support on that side. They don't really have a mandate um, for agriculture in Hong Kong quite yet. So the way we think about it in terms of partnerships is more on the real estate side. We do need to, Hong Kong has a pretty um, rapid turnover of space um, because they can just charge more and the, the revenue, the profitability is great for real estate developers um, and landlords. And so we actually need to secure the space for a longer period of time than what they're used to. Um, and so the partnerships that we really look for is landlords that understand what we're trying to do and that is willing to compromise on the leasing for longer periods of time. And so this is the one that we're currently focused on. Um, other kind of partnerships is, um, for example, fertilizers um, that we would be using um, if we can formulate it. We're a relatively small farm right now, so we don't have the capacity to in-house formulate these things. Um, so these will be the two main ones that we're focusing on right now for partnerships. I see. Um, Omar, um, can you tell us about some of your your approach in terms of you know collaborations or partnerships or joint ventures? Yeah, sure. So I think um, I, I think I believe that uh, you know uh, strategic partnerships are very important to accelerate the growth, um, and you know that uh, experience share adds a lot of value for both entities, and it always has to be a win-win. So we there is government. Uh, uh, partnerships that we, we, we're putting in place and technical partnerships. So, for example, I'm joining this call today from Riyadh in Saudi Arabia and, you know, been talking to the industrial zones where uh, they have a new set of products to support this industry. For example, they would come and uh, they would develop the whole uh, uh, warehouse for us. So we just come in uh, based on our design and they would just come in, we would come in and put our equipment. So. Uh, I know this model is is very popular in the U.S., but but this is the first time that uh, you know a government is doing it in in this part of the world. Um, they're also um, looking to you know reduce uh, customs importation. They're looking to if we export, they'll give us credit, reduce power rate. So there's a lot of things that uh, they're they're forming with the private sector, especially, especially specifically to promote this type of industry. Uh, another form of partnerships we, we, we have formed is the technical partnerships that would be with, for example, the Dutch company that's uh, providing us the, uh, the AI and uh, the history of data. And then we would take all of that in our computers and based on data that we collect, it would you know, provide the recommendations and stuff. Also, we've recently signed uh, a strawberry exclusivity with a, a Dutch uh, supplier. Uh, for for this part of the world and uh, for Singapore, so uh, all of these really do help us in in accelerating uh, our growth and and really taking a good command of the market and and you know uh, advancing it. Fantastic, um, Stacy. Um, in the past few weeks, uh, Air Farms has made quite a few announcements in terms of highlighting some of the partnerships uh, with Cargo and Dell and so many other partnerships. So could you share some of those with us or what those are about? Sure, sure. So I'll start a little bit with generally the farm development. So uh, a recent announcement that we just had was about our expansion into the St. Louis market. 
So that expansion is part of a coalition between the St. Louis area metropolitan um, agriculture coalition and the World Wildlife Federation, a number of other partners to try to advance uh, controlled environment agriculture in the region. So in addition to that though, a lot of the partnerships we have uh, in play right now are technology development partnerships. So we're working with Cargill, uh, just kicked off that relationship to try to think about how we might use uh, indoor vertical farming to help uh, Cargill produce a more sustainable supply chain for cocoa. Uh, we are working with Hortifruit, uh, one of the largest, if not the largest blueberry uh, producer in the world, um, and working with them to think about what a resilient supply chain would look like and how you could use vertical indoor farming to grow blueberries and produce um, higher yields and use different types of genetics uh, to, to help uh, make sure that you've got a sustainable um, long-term supply chain for those products. And I already mentioned the Nokia Bell Labs partner, which is really awesome. Um, you know, we've been uh, very excited about some of the, the kind of more technology advancement that that's going to bring us. It's, it's helping us do better with the plants that we are growing. So it's a little bit of a different angle at it versus a new type of plant or a new technology uh, for growing, it's really about helping us grow better and how do we use this computer advanced technology and drones to, to do that. Uh, the last thing I'll, I'll say is we also, uh, is the Precision Indoor Plants uh, Consortium. We, as I mentioned, we started, we're starting that with lettuce, but that will also extend beyond lettuce in the future to blueberries, strawberries, and other types of plants, but really all about, um, you know, how do we optimize the use of controlled environment agriculture for multiple uh, types of growing and in multiple types of plants, as opposed to just thinking about how does it look outdoors? What do we need to do to customize it so it works indoors? And that might mean different genetics, different varietals, um, different types of growing systems, all kinds of things if you think about it holistically. Uh, and that consortium is, is uh, working to do a lot of that work on multiple different types of, of plants. Great, um, thank you so much. Um, uh, Kendall, same question to you. Yeah, thanks Annabelle. So we look at strategic partnerships um, first in the category of government relations, then in terms of educational institutions, and then in terms of private partnerships. And so those uh, relationships, when you think about government uh, relationships, most people will think of that in terms of incentives. And there's no doubt that there are specific incentives in almost any jurisdiction that you go to. Puerto Rico has some very specific incentives that we're taking advantage of, the lower lease rate, uh, the tax incentives for job credit, uh, tax creation, uh, we get reimbursements, we have a solar grant, a whole variety of things. But I would caveat it to say that we have built our business plan on the premise that those government incentives will eventually expire like they have for the pharmaceutical industry in Puerto Rico. So we've built our business model and our projections and all of our assumptions, assuming that we have no government incentives at all. Now, we're definitely taking advantage of them. And where we're seeing that is in government relations with ministers of agriculture in, in places like Norway or Spain or Colombia, Argentina. Uh, the Philippines. So those are major starting points where the recruitment for them wanting to bring fusion farms into their jurisdictions starts with those government relation pieces. Then we have a very specific program for university relationships because the education component and tying into what's going on from an R&D standpoint, as well as students emerging into this as the new uh, next generation farmers. So we're focused on very specific partnerships with universities. So we have University of Puerto Rico that we're focused on with our internship program. We put 18 interns through our program, We've hired three full-time uh, into our company. And we also have uh, the University of Arizona, Kentucky State University, and we'll shortly be bringing on Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Uh, we are also in a strategic R&D program with uh, Oxford University in England. So we're very focused on those, both from an R&D standpoint with University of Arizona, we're working with the Department of Agriculture. They specifically have a controlled environment ag department. 
that they're working on a specific two programs with us. One is for uh, insects as food, because we're looking at insects as an alternative food source for our fish. And the other is a light study where we're looking at different lights with different lumens with different wattage and evaluating the impact to controlled environment egg growing. So those are some specific areas that we look at from a university standpoint. Probably the most important and most interesting from my standpoint is the private joint venture partnerships that we're building. Um, so we are about to announce multiple joint ventures, one uh, specifically with the school here in Puerto Rico, where we're going to be building three fusion farms on a joint venture uh, that we will be using that as a uh, place where we will be selling uh, discounted food for their school lunch programs. We'll be using it as a, a learning ground for the students, uh, and it will generate a profit source uh, for the schools to help reduce the cost of schooling and provide other things uh, for the school. We're also, uh, so we're expanding in Puerto Rico, but we also have throughout the Caribbean, these joint venture opportunities because every island in the Caribbean has exactly the same issues as Puerto Rico does. So we're in conversations with operators in Bermuda and the Bahamas, Trinidad and Tobago. And we have a joint venture that we expect to announce by the end of the month uh, in the continental US for a 12 farm partnership uh, that we're very excited about, which is, um, again, addressing the issues of unemployment rates, creating more jobs, creating hyper-local healthy greens. So those are the areas that we look at in terms of strategic partnerships. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Kendall. With that, um, being mindful of the time, I, at this point, I'm going to turn the program over back to William Tosinski for the questions and answers section. Okay, thank you, Annabelle, and, and thanks to our panelists for um, great insights. Uh, again, reminding our attendees, if you have a question, please put it in the chat function and we'll, we'll bring them up. Um, but we also have some pre-prepared questions that we'll start with. Uh, the first one is, can you contrast and compare um, the differences between hydroponics versus agroponics? That sounds like a question for Kendall. So Kendall? Sure, so we are, so the definition of aquaponics is that it does incorporate hydroponics as a water growing source, whether it's NFT or deep water culture or shallow water culture or media beds. That's a water growing methodology. So it's a hydroponic growing strategy combined with the aquaculture side of the business which is the growing of fish in a controlled environment. So we combine those two into aquaponics, uh, which is the combination of those two. So the differences are that we're using fish as the nutrient source, as opposed to hydroponics, uh, which is creating a water recipe of nutrients specific typically to the crops that are being grown. Okay, and we now have some other questions coming in. Uh, partly with a comment. One is they use some great solutions for providing food. Solutions often bring new challenges. The technologies used in vertical farming, as in many green technologies, use limited resources, especially rare earth metals. I've heard we do not have enough rare earth metals to support green technology, a full, full replacement for fossil fuel technology. Everyone seems to be looking at the production cycle. Have you, or how are you looking at accessing enough capital equipment to build systems for future growth? Is anyone looking downstream to recycle the hardware and materials on the technology that is used to recover resources? Fantastic question. Um, so actually that question can be answered by any of our panelists. I'm gonna ask for volunteers if you'd like to address that or any of you would like yeah, to- I'm happy to jump in real quick because sure. what really we're addressing is a zero waste initiative where we're attempting to get to zero waste. So we have a variety of uh, recycling initiatives. Uh, so we're doing uh, everything that we produce, we're trying to either reuse or recapture uh, at the farm. So we do have a controlled environment indoor. So we have 11,500 square foot building, but we also have 1.4 acres that we're also doing outdoors. So we're using a combination of a variety of ecosystems to generate a zero waste facility. Um, and as part of that, through you know, solar energy and alternative energy, you know, there is no 
not yet a clear solution. So even though we're using recycled plastics as some of our, you know, instead of net pots, we're using uh, water bottles, cut off the tops, turn those upside down, and we're using those as our net pots instead of adding more plastic into the area. So I would love to be able to say we're not using any plastics um, and, and the ultimate solution is we go away from plastic manufacturing altogether. That's unfortunately not even possible in this world at this point. So we are trying to reuse plastics uh, in ways that are you know, reducing our uh, greenhouse gases and reducing our footprint uh, from that standpoint. So we're excited about the opportunities to demonstrate and be an example for recycling zero waste and reusing things that would normally just become part of the, the gray water distribution into the existing sewer systems. Okay, great. Uh, the next question is, can you compare the taste and nutritional value for indoor grown crops versus hill grown? Bill, if you don't mind, I would love to hear the other panelists answer the last question if you want to give them an oh, opportunity okay. to do that. Is that okay? Yes, That's fine. absolutely. So um, anyone else who'd like to go first? Um, Omar or Jessica or Stacy? I sure I can make a couple of comments. Um, I think to Kendall's point, this is this is something that uh, everyone is working towards. So do we have the perfect answers? Absolutely not. We're, but it's always on our minds. I think at AeroFarms, we've been um, from the very inception of our growing system, we've used recyclable substrate. So it's made out of plastic bottles and we continuously use it. So we don't use pots um, and we don't use other plastics in our growing. So we use a consistent um, a substrate that is made from recycled materials and we continually use it. Um, the other thing we try to do is look at ways for um, a second harvest potentially for our, uh, after we harvest our crops, there are, there's remaining material, both plant material and root material. So we're looking at how do we think about what are some of the outlets for those types of materials whether they be in uh, their processed products or whether there might be some nutritional or other type of high value component uh, in, in the root system that we could potentially think about. Uh, so I'll, that's kind of uh, my point of view on, on a few of those comments and uh, I'll let Jessica and uh, Omar take from here if they'd like. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, in our case, uh, 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 it's it's in the making. It's something that we're trying uh, to figure out how to go get to that uh, zero waste and really reuse everything uh, uh, that goes into the uh, growing. Uh, and then, and then we're, it, we're just trying to figure it out, really. Jessica, any comments or anything that you'd like to add? Sure. So um, for us, I mean, I think like everyone's saying, it's all in the pro in the process. Um, it's not as, you know, the way that we all maybe all want to, but I think we all have that methodically um, placed into our operations. So for us, we have partly using um, soil base. And so we compost all of that. And the way we use it is we actually have an outdoor farm um, on a rooftop just to benchmark on um, some of the production. Maybe something is better outside and maybe we should reconsider things. And so we'll utilize the compost that we have for the growing um, on a rooftop farm. Um, that way um, it gives it that second life. And then we're trialing um, developing more of um, a compost system that we can potentially reutilize the nutrients that's um, in the, in, through our production. Thank you. Um, Bill, any other questions? Yeah, I got a few here. First one, uh, it's gonna be very interesting. It's comparing land agriculture to indoor growing. What are the differences in taste and nutritional quality? Wow, that sounds like a question that we could start maybe, um, Stacy, would you like to address that first? Sure. So I'll just say flat out, all plants are nutritious, <laughs> highly nutritious. So I think, I think that's the thing to keep in mind is that, um, you know, so we're already starting with a very high bar when we're working with plant material because plant material is, is quite nutritious just naturally. So 
one of the things that we've been doing at Aeroforms, we've just wrapped up um, a very, probably a three to four year project looking at how to utilize plant stressors, so abiotic factors, lighting, uh, nutrition, and other, other factors to improve taste and nutritional characteristics of leafy greens. So we've had some really interesting results. We're gonna continue um, to do that work. Um, I think you can imagine that uh, it's, it's interesting to think about how you might differentiate in the market with, with those types of features. We've also just recently launched um, what we call our flavor spectrum. So if you happen to uh, purchase our products or are anywhere near our um, markets, you can see um, our products are, we're driving products uh, trial in the marketplace by calling out various um, flavor characteristics that are specific to our leafy greens relative to other products that you might find in the marketplace. And those, that flavor spectrum is correlated with the color. So you can, if you're looking at a red colored package, you know that that product is spicy or has a nice peppery flavor. So we're really trying to think about educating the consumers about the whole spectrum of flavor, along with the whole spectrum of, of produce that's available through vertical farming. Yeah, that visual really does work. I've seen new products and I've seen the new color-coded uh... Um, guy that's that stands out yeah it's a great new branding i love it love it yeah awesome. anyone else would like to add any of those key differences in terms of nutritional value freshness or taste or flavor uh, uh, so I'll, I'll i'll add to stacy's uh, uh they're, they're they're highly nutritious in terms of taste the really vertical farming you should think of it or indoor farming uh, or growing in a warehouse series, it's like a five-star facility. You know, you're spoiling the plants. Uh, you're giving them the night temperature, day, day temperature, uh, giving them the, the perfect the light spectrum, depending on the crop, depending on the day, giving them, you know, the managing the humidity, CO2, oxygen, water. So to me personally, it tastes uh, you know, it's full of flavor. It's fresher. Uh, it doesn't have to deal with this harsh environment, uh, environment outdoors. Um, so in terms of taste, taste, it does stand out. It lasts longer. And, uh, uh, and, and yeah, definitely it's, it, it's a level of uh, outdoor, especially in our part of the world. Yes. Anyone else would like to add or would, can we? Yeah, so I'd, I'd like to add just a little bit sure. different. I totally agree in terms of flavor, color. Uh, we've had visitors to our farm that have, you know, tasted our strawberries um, and absolutely were blown away because number one, you, do, you just don't see strawberries grown in a high heat, high humidity area. So growing strawberries in Puerto Rico is novel, but when you compare that to strawberries that are imported from California, right? Driscoll is a huge manufacturer of strawberries. Well, just like the tomatoes, the challenge in Puerto Rico is that the taste is not always the same and the nutrition is very different. And we, and we uh, associate that with uh, food miles, right? So food coming 1500 food miles when it goes a week on a truck from California to Florida, and then it gets on a ship and it spends another week. One of the things that is most consumers don't know is that when you harvest spinach, it has a high volume of vitamin C as an example of the nutrients, right? But when you pick that within 24 hours, 90% of that vitamin C is gone. So when you talk about, you know, farm to table, fresh is important, taste is important, but there's also a component that we're focused on, which is hyper-local, immediate access to the highest nutrition possible. Because what the labels on food products don't show you is how those nutrients degrade over time. So that's a very important piece that we're working on with the Department of Health here in Puerto Rico, uh, because there's such a high incidence of obesity and diabetes. And we believe that healthy, nutritious leafy greens is a part of the solution. And so when you look at the nutrition label, it doesn't say nutrition label after day one or after day 10. And in, in many cases where it's after day 14, there's very little nutrition in those products that have been shipped across country or those food miles. So it's extremely important from our perspective, which is why we focus on hyper-local to get true value in that nutrient base of the plants. At least two of you have mentioned the strawberries, Omar and Kendall. And can you tell our audience about the pollination within an indoor vertical farm? How does that happen? 
Sure. So there are two methods that we're using. One, there are uh, uh, a special uh, bee variety that's being breeded out of um, Holland that could function under the artificial lighting. Uh, so that's uh, one method. Another method is uh, using drones. Uh, where they would go and uh, you know pollinate the plant. So these are two very interesting developments in the growing of strawberries indoors and vertically. Yeah, similar to that. Similar to that, we have um, a hand pollination, right, where you can use vibrators or air blowers to manually pollinate the plants. There's also aeration misters that you can uh, put the pollen in and do aeration robotically. Uh, that can be done through drones, as Omar mentioned. And then the third way is that we're actually in a partnership with the Karma Honeybee Project. And so we're actually uh, testing uh, right now in the process of designing, testing an indoor-outdoor beehive so that the uh, bees can both access internally to the plants that are available that require pollination and then outside uh, if there isn't sufficient pollen in the indoor facility, they can also access outside. So we're excited about that because bees are an extremely important piece of the global ag supply system and figuring out how to get them indoors. And obviously our workers in an indoor lab environment, the lab suits become beekeeper suits, but that's a whole different discussion. <laughs> Completely uh, separate, but this is kind of interesting and that uh, makes me think of the next question in terms of pest management. So these facilities are biosecure facilities sealed from the outside world, but in reality, there is always an ingress and in some cases you may have pests that actually come into the indoor vertical facility. When that happens, how is that handled? What sort of pest management um, are you all using? I'm going to start with uh, Kendall since you're on at the moment. Yeah, sure. So um, if, if anybody tells you that a controlled environment, even biosecurity at the highest level, because uh, I've been involved in pharmaceutical manufacturing where you have positive air pressure, medical containment facilities. If you have people moving in and out of facilities, you're going to have pests. So the issue is, how do you manage those? We have chosen not to use any herbicides or pesticides. So we're using completely organic uh, meth methods for dealing with those. So uh, in the case of aphids, as an example, uh, we have a uh, microscopic um, uh, wasp that actually uh, attacks the aphids, uh, uses their tail to implant their eggs, and they kill the, the aphid, and then they generate more wasps uh, as part of the process. So it's kind of like the, um, <laughs> the microscopic uh, alien wars is really what's going on in the facility, but it's a, a, a natural method of managing pests. And so for all the negative pests, there are typically positive pests that can assist in managing those depending upon, you know, whether it's white flies or grubs or whatever the issue is that you're dealing with. We are focused on, you know, organic or natural uh, pest mitigation methods. Anyone else, um, Omar or Stacy or Jessica? I mean, in the leafy greens uh, and lettuces where uh, I mean, pest is under control, obviously we don't use any pesticides on that. Um, we use it's yellow stickers or yellow traps and they capture the insects that do make it into the grow room. In terms of the uh, strawberries, it's a bit more uh, complicated and we use something, something similar, integrated pest management where natural good predators are eating the bad predators. Um, um, William, go ahead, uh, Jessica. Yeah, sorry. Um, so for us, it's also really, it's really about the managing part of it, um, really knowing what you're managing and also understanding, you know, the population size as well. So for us, the main um, pest we have is fungal gnat. Um, but what we try to do is control the larvae um, before it becomes the, the actual fly. Um, and then for anything, we set up a system where it's, we have the specific protocols. If it's, if it's a pest that we don't know about, then we would try to just do the, the crop elimination first before it overspreads um, in our grow rooms. So um, it's, it's never 100%, but definitely we want to keep it um, uh, bio and organic and really manage it before it overspreads. 
Stacey, anything you'd like to add? I think generally what the other panelists have mentioned are, I mean, many of us are trying to looking at um, organic or uh, other types of, of methods of controlling and uh, controlling pests. So same, same idea, we are pesticide herbicide free at Aero Farms and anything that we would do to manage pests would be of a natural, uh, from a natural source or using natural methods. Thank you. Um, William, uh, Bill Tosinski, I'm going to um, pass it over to you. Are there any other final questions that you'd like to ask or would you? Um... There are lots of final questions, but we are at 201. So unfortunately, um, you know, I think we have to find a way. Is there a way for people to reach the panelists? Um, certainly, we are going to be including uh, within the post that will have the video contact information for all four panelists. Um, they're very active in all social media uh, platforms, so anyone interested can reach out directly to them. Yeah, unfortunately, we had so many good questions, but not enough time. So that's always the way of the world. Anyway, I'd like to wrap it up. Thank everyone for attending and participating. And thank you to Annabelle and our panelists. Appreciated the great content. And we look forward to seeing you learning about uh, the new cheese on the block, these foods and the future of pizza. We'll be doing that hopefully as a hybrid meeting. And uh, one of the things we, we haven't quite locked it down, but hopefully we'll have some pizza with please cheese on the menu. So look out for that. And as I say, that will be a hybrid meeting and um, you can also participate virtually. So I think Ken, I think I saw Kendall put his contact information in the chat so you can grab it from there and we'll see you in October. Thank you very much.